they were saying I was gonna miss two years. I was like, oh my god, two years. Like I was upset to not play for two years and whatnot. So I have known you since you were probably nine or ten. Yeah. You were playing on a team called the Gators. Wasn't it with Pro Sling? Well, it was. Because yeah, you were yeah. in combine behind Pro Sling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were having our team train like back there. Day. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> have I told you that back then? Because those, were, I still to this day feel like those were the hardest workouts I've ever done. Oh, they probably were because I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I would be sitting in class in middle school, whatever grade that was, like fifth, sixth grade, and be trying to just sit there and stay still all day to save all my energy for those <laughs> for those workouts at night. <laughs> Yes, those were a, definitely a different style, different breed of uh, training back then. Uh, that was the available resources I had at the moment in terms of education. <laughs> they were like heavily cross Yes, yeah, oh, big time. Yeah. yeah, just trying to figure out what you guys could take. Yeah, yeah. I, I see Kenny over there shaking his head yes because you know he loved that I would make you guys go on half mile run out of nowhere or run you know a ten k for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> But um, yes, those workouts were, were were a wee bit different than uh, where we got to in the past. But like even seeing you at nine years old and I, I think at that moment too, you were uh, I like, obviously you're a lefty, but I'm pretty sure they were trying you to keep you at like shortstop or stuff like that. You were playing the infield at that, that age. Uh, it wasn't like they were sticking you to first base left field. Um, so, because you were, even at that age, you could see you were ridiculously athletic, right? So like global movement patterns for you came pretty easy. It wasn't like you were going to need to be taught how to run properly. Just throw you out there, let you run and you were going to do it. Um, but uh, the, the, as we like continued working together and then I think refound each other when we opened athletes warehouse and and in that era now you had you had just about like put yourself on the map from a baseball perspective and it was like just starting yeah that was well you opened athletes warehouse in 2014 which was my freshman year of high school which is when i stopped playing other sports and started to actually kind of work towards baseball you went to iona my freshman, freshman year, year right mm -hmm. yeah and then, so I think we actually started up again right then, right when you were leaving there and you were going back to Horace Greeley. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I was coming in like when I was at Iona. No. But when I got to Greeley in my sophomore year, yeah, I was definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, it was like over that summer in that transition period. But um, I think it was like at that moment where I saw what you had different in your eyes than a lot of other guys at that moment in time was uh, you wanted more. You wanted to figure out, at least that was the impression I got, which was like, I wanna understand more, I wanna push more, I wanna figure out what I can do at a higher level. And you were not satisfied with, or just shut up and do it. Like, trust me, it was, why am I doing it? What are we doing to get better? What is this gonna help me with? And I'll always credit you with one of the uh, the things you did for me, like in my career was challenged so much early on, whether you meant to or not, it was challenged so much early on that it was like, okay, wait a minute. Like this isn't, we can't just make this kid sweat. He's going to be good. Like we have to get better. We have to understand deeper. Like we have to try and figure out how we're going to get him to, you know, actually achieve the things he wants to achieve. And, um, I think that was, I was like pretty evident right away as a sophomore in high school, uh, whether you think you had that type of mentality or not comparable to the others around you, it was, it was profoundly different. Yeah. I just think, I think I just started to develop a genuine curiosity for pitching and training and baseball in general. And if you were to tell me to do something and I didn't actually understand it, like I just genuinely wanted to get a better understanding. Mm. And how do you think that's helped you continually throughout your career now? Well, obviously being more knowledgeable helps. You can, like, I can then go and help myself when you're not around, for example. But also if you're telling me to do, let's say, something within my mechanics, if I actually really understand the reason, I'm probably going to be better at doing it. 
Yeah, 100%. Right. You're going to actually understand how to implement this. Yeah. Right. As opposed to just blindly trusting and just going after it. Um, it does cause, it also, what I saw out of you too, was the more curiosity you had and the, which I think this is, this is a super important anecdote for a lot of athletes that are training right now. And the reason I state that, and, and like, like I said before, the reason I gave you so much credit for shaping my career is it, it really forced me to have athletes take autonomy over their career and their training. And without that, I think ultimately you're just a follower and you're not actually going to get the most out of it. You were curious, but you were trying to understand where is our end goal and what are the objectives I have to complete on that path? And the more you started understanding those, the deeper your buy-in became and into the program, into what we were doing. And I think ultimately what's amazing about the concept of buy-in is I could have been doing something so wrong, but if you were buying into it and we could get you to execute a movement pattern better, you ultimately were significantly better simply because you had fleshed out your curiosity. You had bought in way more. And I mean, you had mentioned it the other day. You were like, yeah, compared to like what we used to do, this is way different. And well, the whole way you go about teaching the throw has evolved so much. Yeah. Well, it. It had to have, right? Because it's just stagnation would have meant we had figured everything out when it came to that. And that just wasn't the case. You know, we had basically proven that it worked for you. And that was it. You know what I mean? We had like, we had like a few other guys that were like moderately successful off of it, but it wasn't like, like today where we could roll out 20 plus guys throwing 90 miles an hour in high school. Yeah. (laughs) You know, so like, it was sort of like this check myself moment where I was like, well, we, we probably don't have this figured out. Um, and we still didn't manage to fuck you up along the way, which was great. Um, but that time period with you and understanding the pressures that were on, it was really one of the first times, because stumbling over my words here, but I remember you as a sophomore and junior in high school. And it was literally like, like you were walking on water. You were so unbelievably confident, so unbelievably focused. It was like nothing got in your way whatsoever because you were like, I'm training harder than everybody else. I'm doing more than everybody else. There's nothing anybody can say to me because I am I know what I have to be doing and I know it's working. And then came the pressure of the draft. And what I saw, because to being totally transparent, I had never really witnessed a high school athlete having that much pressure to perform at a high school baseball game. I hadn't yet, I hadn't seen that. And I'm getting to go through it with you and Henry at the exact same time, coaching Henry at high school and then training you and then eventually playing against you too, even at high school. But I mean, I think you were meeting with a a new team every single night after you were leaving the training session that night. My, uh, before my senior spring, there were, a good amount of meetings that winter. I mean, it was how that, that was the maybe not worst isn't the right part, but where I had to go out of my comfort zone and I was a 17 or eight year old, 18 year old meeting with big league teams. And I felt like a obviously an interview of some sort, which I had never done before. I'd never been in that position. So that was uncomfortable for me at the time. Yeah. It's so much, yeah. Like it was great. They were obviously, it was my dream, but it's also like I'm a young kid and the teams I've always dreamed of playing for are coming to my house to interview me. It's like, holy shit. <laughs> and it's surreal, right? Yeah. And also I'm trying to give the right answers, which I don't even know at the time what the right answers are. <laughs> like my parents would be sitting there with me too at the table. Judging you. Ah. Somewhat, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, just like fearful, I'm sure for, for you, just, you know, being a parent, just being like, I hope he didn't say anything to mess himself up and like, yeah, you know. Knowing your parents at home, I'm sure they were, you know, in, immensely supportive throughout the whole thing. Um, but like, so you're meeting with all these teams now, right? And when did you get the realization that that was possible? Well, the summer after my junior year, when I was going to Area Code and the All-American Games, and they were saying, I remember being at the Perfect Game All-American Game, and we had a meeting a day or two before, and they're like, I think 
at least the year I was there was 50 high school players. And they're like the previous All-American game, the year before I was there, like 40 of 50 guys got drafted. And I was like, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> and like the other 10 obviously went to big time programs. Right. So. so that was sort of your like, wow, I'm, I'm actually kind of pretty good. Yeah. It, it's funny too. What do you think? I mean, that's a combination of humility, naiveness, Definitely. right? And like, you know, this sort of, did that, did that drive you more or get you afraid? No, it didn't make me afraid. I felt like I felt like I belonged. Okay. Um, I suppose it, I mean, I already felt so driven at that point. Like I was already very focused and doing everything I felt like I could do to get better each day. But it, I guess gave the confidence that like I'm on the right track. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And it's working. So it created a deeper buy-in even. Yeah. Now I remember during that time, right? Because what I what I do like talking about, because we have we have a lot of kids who deal with that that same sort of sensation, but because the world is different now, right? Like uh going back to when you're talking about, I mean, Instagram was like coming onto the scene, things like that weren't like you know, there was no, obviously no TikTok, no, like, like the social media wasn't the way it is now. Right. So like, yes, you were in the top 50 in the country. Right. But like, I felt like I didn't know anybody who had, I didn't know anybody personally who had done it before. So like it was all new to me as it was unfolding. And maybe like the high schoolers in the gym now, they have seen guys a couple years older, whether it's the pro guys in the gym or the guys who are now at big time programs or guys who have gotten national recognition in high school, like they've kind of seen it happen ahead of them. So I suppose as they're coming into that, like they have an idea of what happens. But when it was happening for me, it was, I didn't, it just, as it was coming to me, I was seeing it for the first time. Right. It, how it, did you find it overwhelming at all? No, I don't know if I, I don't think I would say that. Okay. Was the, like, did you ever feel like it, it distracted you or pulled you away? from what you wanted to be focusing on. I'm talking now like I think the thing I was focused like if if anything was causing stress or anything along those lines it was worry of my shoulder at the time. Cuz going it was, it was my junior uh my junior spring I heard it swinging. And so going through the All-American games and stuff, like I remember throwing beforehand and my shoulder shoulder hurts fuck bad. But I was young and dumb and still happy with my performance and vila i was like ah, oh, it's probably not that bad but I just kept playing and with the end game adrenaline it didn't bother me in the game but then i guess when my when my senior spring came around it was still hurting i was like god like i'm like this is the spring before the draft i really want to be at my best and i feel so limited there was a moment in there though where we had i think we had gotten you pain free and then we had one, a swing again out of nowhere re yeah, really pull us into I I I heard it again swinging my senior year, but I, was it? It was. Free? It, was like it a, was probably not like out of your mind, but it was at the point I believe where like I can I can still go out and perform. I think though there was like piecemealing you back together after every game and trying to get into, the, you know, get you to the point where it was like, okay, I can manage now going this game. But I think after that swing, it was like wow, we were this was gonna be big overhaul. I remember. uh I think it was my last start of my senior year, maybe second to last or whatever. But there are a lot of scouts who come to the game and I was warming up, starting my throw in the outfield for the game and just every single throw hurt so bad. And I was like, I can't not pitch because there's a bunch of scouts here to watch, but every fucking throw hurts so bad. And I was like, holy shit, this is like, what do I, I didn't know what to do. I did well, <laughs> but... uh. <laughs> But even still, I wasn't able to perform as best as I felt I could. Yeah. Given I was, sure. health, I was healthy. still limited. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, so I, I can always recall uh, my partner, Cassie, saying to me, because at the time she was like still coaching on the floor. And I think we were still, I was not training you one-to-one, -one, but we were definitely like, I was giving you a lot of attention on, I think, some of the lifts and we had like started to really change up some of your lifts and get it to the point where we were trying to find another gear. Um, and you, I think it was like you, you had, you had just come off of like three days in a row of meeting with teams and 
yet another one that night. And I just remember she walked over and she goes, why does he look so miserable? <laughs> and, and I think ultimately at the end of the day, right, is whether you realize it or not, I think for the first time you, you start to understand that like, oh, I have to like do other things other than just focus on being great at baseball and just like trying to do really well. And there were all these other responsibilities that were taking you way out of your comfort zone, as you indicated before, um, and forcing you to have to like constantly answer the bell and and in an in an domain that wasn't something you enjoyed, right? Like if you had to constantly compete every night for baseball, you would have been like, yes, yeah, fine. But you had to explain who you were. You had to spend this time talking about yourself and all these things that I think for you weren't something you regularly did or wanted to hold in high regard. And I don't think ultimately was something that you were looking at as excitement in terms of like sitting there broadcasting about yourself. This was more like, I wanted to just show what I can do. Um, I don't know, you, you have any recollection of like- that Well, time? I mean, I agree with that in terms of some of those meetings, like it was amazing to have the teams come, but I guess I didn't really feel comfortable feeling like I was trying to sell myself to these teams like I just wanted to them to watch me play and be like oh yeah well we like him I didn't want to have to sit there for an hour or two at night and I didn't like the idea of trying to like sell myself to them and not come across as super cocky but I am trying to prove to them that they should draft me yeah it's a very challenging concept especially for a 17 18 year old yeah um we're going through this time period right you're meeting all these teams at your house. It's obviously this super exciting time period, but still in the back of your head, you have this, you know, sort of like major thing weighing you down, which is like, my shoulder fucking hurts every day. Um, and there's a tough battle there, right? There's a tough battle between like, am I letting this be known or am I? Yeah, well, I didn't know what was wrong with it. I just knew it hurt, which like any smart person would be like, I'll see a doctor. But like I said earlier, I was still performing well and happy with my velocity and everything. I was just like, oh, maybe it'll go away. I don't want to make it known. Really? If, if it's not anything serious, I don't want to make it known. Right. So I was trying not to say anything, but it was affecting my performance. And Towards the end, it definitely, you know, it was, it was weighing on you way too much. Yeah. Um, what, what ultimately, because out of that scenario, right, part of that decision you know, at in this time period, you had committed to UVA. So like, let's not discredit the fact that that was a huge milestone. For oh, you. yeah. Well, when it came to deciding, do I want to, when the draft cut closer and closer, I was like, do I want to consider the draft or go to school? And it was a combination that I loved what I thought I had at UVA, which ended up being completely true. It was amazing. It was also the fact that I was worried about my shoulder and I wasn't performing as well as I would like, causing me to probably not get drafted as high as I would have liked. And also, I think, like I had said earlier, I didn't know anyone personally who had considered the draft at high school and was doing those things. I didn't really understand. I knew what college was like because I grew up always picturing myself going to college. But I didn't really understand what pro ball was like at the time. Like, I understood, obviously, you go and play baseball every day and it's your job, but like, I just couldn't visualize it in my head. I, I just didn't have a good understanding of it. And the idea of going to school felt more comfortable and safer. And obviously UVA was so great and I could take that safer route, if you want to say, and still get drafted after UVA. So a combination of those things led me to coming out and saying before the draft that I'm not going to entertain this. I'm going to go to school. How did that mess up? Yeah. My dad and I got in touch with one of the local high school sport um reporters and we talked with him and he put out an article cool and what was how did you hear about the because you you had advisement at this time right uh -huh. which was really like that was new too like advisement for a high school kid um how what was their advice for you during that time period they were letting things play out i think and if I remember correctly, also trying to get a feel on what I felt best with, like, you know, just trying, because they were trying to see was pro ball something I really wanted to do out of high school, was college maybe the better route, 
They were trying to work it out and just let things progress. They uh, they weren't trying to make a definitive decision early on. Um, but then, like as I said, things unfolded, and college certainly was the better seemed like the better route to go. And it it was uh, we all agreed that that was the way to go. So you're you pull out, and I'm assuming at this point you had communicated with UVA that hey, my shoulder is not right. I had told the pitching coach at the time even when it happened my junior year. So he was somewhat aware. And how did they treat you? Was it any different? What, you know, what, what was their route to how we're going to handle this? Well, they were throughout high school, just aware and trying to also figure out how I felt in terms of the draft or whether or not I was going to be at school. But once I got to campus was really when we really addressed my shoulder and got it looked at. I was right away in my freshman fall. Yep. And the ultimately the decision was to have surgery. Yes. Um, let's dig in a little bit because I remember talking to you on the phone when you ultimately made that decision and the sound in your voice was distinctly different. <laughs> I, yeah, I was, I remember crying outside the stadium, but also looking back, I didn't realize the significance of getting surgery on your labrum as a pitcher. I didn't realize I had no clue of the success rate. I just thought it was the same as maybe Tommy John. Like you just get the surgery and do the rehab and come back. And I was like, oh, I'll miss. They were saying I was going to miss two years. I was like, oh my God, two years. Like I was upset to not play for two years and whatnot, but I didn't realize the success rate of labrum surgery. I had no idea about it. I was naive to it the whole time. <laughs> yeah. And Which I, probably played to my advantage. It, yeah, because the initial reaction, I think, from you was relief when well i was also like all right now like i said i didn't realize the significance of getting it done i was like all right now we're going to address it we're going to get the surgery and in due time i'll be back right did not even just play to your advantage yeah and right. so yeah at that moment which, which uh there's a lot of scenarios in life where naiveness plays to your advantage i mean shit like being an entrepreneur naiveness you better be naive because in the beginning you ain't gonna make it um and there's gonna be a lot of times where you shouldn't make it and for some reason it pulls through but so you're, when did you realize, like they said, they gave you that mark. Like they're like, yeah, two years before you feel like you, how difficult was that to like understand? Well, like I said, I remember, I remember going outside the stadium and texting, I'm sure I called my parents right away. And then I remember texting you and CJ and telling you the news that it was torn, I was going to get surgery being very upset right there but the next thing like from there on out is look i was just start the rehab get the surgery done begin the rehab just follow the path which, which, which is an incredible mindset how where do you think that stems from well i like i said i didn't know the significance so i didn't realize to be skeptical of whether or not i would come back and what other option do you have but to do the work get to work <laughs> what other uh, option? I, I, I think I think you're underplaying how profound of a mindset that actually is. Uh, I, and I get it. I get it. You're almost like, well, I don't understand because I don't think any other way. And I, I, I well, I get people who may not think that way, but why? Um, yeah, it was uh, my goal of playing and having a successful college career, and then going on and playing the bigs. It didn't change. That was still my goal. So get to work. <laughs> uh, I, listen, I love the simplicity at which that, that operates in your brain. And, and I, I could only wish to have one tenth of the rest of our, our, you know, athlete pool actually think that way. But the, and I think you're probably giving naiveness a little too much credit there. How do you find yourself being that present in everything you do? Cause that's, that's an immensely present mindset as opposed to this incredibly future-based mindset um, or fearful future-based mindset, right? Like, shit, I'm not going to accomplish those goals. I mean, I think it, the, that concept and the lessons I learned from surgery have helped me throughout my career, like going this off season after not having the season I was hoping for this past year, my first year of pro ball, like I need to get better. I can sit there and dwell on an unsuccessful season, but what do I need to do? Go to the gym every day and do everything I can do every day to make sure come spring training, I've, I've taken care of every everything I could do this off season to be in the best spot. Just I know the work that has to be done and just get it done. It's really as simple as that. 
Is that approach done day by day or is that approach even, can you look 10 days down the road and be like, yeah, I know what I need to do between now and then. And I know where I'm going to be 10 days from now, or is it more like, I understand the work that I need to put in and, you know, today I got to focus on what I'm doing today. Mm, what do you mean? Well, so like, it doesn't sound as though they're, you're, you're affording the potential for ulterior scenarios in what's going to occur this year. Well, I don't know what's going to unfold this season for me, but I remember telling you this at some point this offseason is like, I need to make sure that I have zero regrets about this offseason. I took care of everything I could have taken care of. I did everything I could have done. And whether the season coming up goes better than I could have ever imagined or unsuccessful, I can't have regrets about what I could have done differently, what I could have done more, especially. And that was the same with the rehab back then in college. Like, it's like, incredibly. I just couldn't, I couldn't have it. regrets. Like, <laughs> right. I can't look back and said, I could have, uh, I could have done more. So the, the, the idea that you want to stay focused on making sure everything you're doing in this current moment is feeding that end goal. You feel like that drives you. You feel like that, that again? does that underpin your makeup? Yeah. And maybe you'll look back and say, like, sure, I'll look back on my career and maybe say, oh, I maybe could have done this differently. But at the time, I thought I was doing everything I could have done. It's incredibly powerful. It's a very difficult thing for individuals to actually possess. Um, do, you, do you find that when you're in that mindset, are you able to trust what you're currently going through or does it cause you to question it and become sort of overly curious as to what else could I possibly be adding? Um, well, I mean, as the off season or even like at any point you evolve your routine or what you're doing as you learn more, as you find something new that maybe you should add, like it evolves, but on the given day, I'm doing what on that day, what I think everything I can get done, I, I try and get it done. Cool. It's very, it's an impressive mindset to have, especially for somebody your age and then how well that will carry you into re regardless of what domain that might be. If you can keep that on a consistent basis, I cannot tell you how many young individuals are losing sight of what's going on today because of where they're expecting themselves to be six, 10, 12 weeks later, and the ramifications of today, six, 10, 12 weeks later. Well, it's like, at least for me, and it seems like every successful person talks about having your goals and writing them down. So like go, going this, going back to the beginning of the off season, I had my goals for the end of the off season, and then you backtrack and figure, all right, how can I make sure I get there and do everything that you have? Every idea that you have, everything that you have written down, do it, do it all to give your, whether you accomplish goals or not, every, you've, you've fleshed out everything you possibly have. Yeah. Yeah. You followed the plan. It's awesome. All right. So we're coming back from, we, we've gotten yeah. surgery, right? What's that first year like? <laughs> Lots of time in the training room. <laughs> and then once I would finish my rehab, go out there and just stand at practice and watch, which cool. sucked. Um, <laughs> but a lot of time in the training room. Um, I just think she, sounds like a lot. I felt so my freshman year of college, I felt so busy. Like, okay. um, because for one, obviously it's a whole new experience, college, and it's all come at you so fast. I have classes from 8 a.m. until one or whatever it was, and then somehow managed to pick up lunch on the way to the field, which practice is somehow starting right after class if not during class, like somehow get to the field in time. And then I'm going through my rehab and I'm out at practice and practice is going on. And then I have my freshman year had study hours or tutoring or whatever, because they're trying to make sure like the freshmen stay on top of their stuff. So I had stuff after practice and I get home and then I would have my homework that I would get done. I'd be going to bed at whatever time it was and wake up and doing it again over. So it, it, my days, my freshman year were the most packed they've ever been in my life. So I didn't have time to sit and dwell or think. Like I, I had stuff to get done every single day, the whole day. So the keeping busy helped, uh, <laughs> helped that brain. I didn't have time forward. to yeah, overthink things. Like I just had to keep 
I just had to get to class and then get to practice and do this and do that the whole year it felt like. So let's go into now we're coming into our sophomore year, uh, still dealing with the rehabbing of the shoulder, right? But yes, but my sophomore year I was starting to throw. So it was exciting. I mean, you had, this is a pretty invasive labrum uh, surgery too, by the way. I think we got five acres. No, I had three. Three. Um, but then my sophomore year, or maybe the end of my freshman spring, I started tossing super lightly. But then come my sophomore year, it was progressing. And at some point that fall or spring, I was getting in the mound. So it was all excited. Like the progression was happening. I was getting back to kind of playing baseball again. So the road map is going close. Yes. Okay. And uh, there was, <laughs> it still hurt at times. Like it was still, it was certainly not just a smooth progression. And my trainer, who I realized very quickly was very smart and knew, really knew what he was doing, which was such a blessing. But he told me right at the beginning, he goes, your route to playing again is not going to be just this smooth, smooth path. Like there's going to be ups and downs all the time. So he told me that right away. And so I knew that going into it. Being you, you took that for facts and you were like, all right, so I'm expecting these. Yeah. Um, which is incredibly difficult for most kids rehabbing. Um, you know, how many, how many moments in there? Because I mean, if you've ever been through a rehab thing, you know, how many moments in there were you like, oh, it's destroyed again? Well, it's funny because there was never a, there was never a point where I felt I wouldn't get back and feel like myself again. That time period just kept, seem, seemed to keep getting longer and longer for that to actually be the case. But I believe that it was going to happen. Now, eventually. So you're, you're talking, you're talking like two years away from being competitive. Mm -hmm. Like, ha you lose yourself during that? You, you, you know, yeah. I mean, like you, you, you've described most of your personality right now as like, I'm doing everything I possibly can to be the best version of myself every damn day. And I'm going to make sure of that so that I don't ever regret a day. I mean, they've taken or circumstances has taken this thing about you, which is this ability to compete at such a high level. How does that, how do we navigate that? So as I, as my throwing progressed and I started throwing bullpens and then really once I started throwing to batters and scrimmages or live BPs or whatever it was, there became a point where my velo was back. I was throwing strikes. I was having somewhat success, but I felt like I was ending those outings and being like, okay, it was another, it was another time I went out there. My shoulder was successful. I made it through like the results were generally good, let's say, but there was, there was something missing to it. Okay. It felt like I was going through, which obviously I was, but it felt like I was just going through this rehab prescription instead of going out there and competing and trying to dominate these hitters and feeling like I'm the man again. Like, and that's when we talked on the phone and I was telling this to you, I was like, I like, yeah, I had another who was successful in the sense that my shoulder felt good. Like the results were good, but man, it doesn't feel like it did in high school. Like there's something missing about it. Like, and you were telling me how I was probably still, I was just, I was not competing and like, then there was not that fire to it that I had, um, which I didn't realize I would lose, but I guess happened over two years of not playing. Like I caught what that was like to feel that fire. Yeah. It was just like, I was just trying to like check these spots. I was going out there with my live BPs or scrimmages. This wasn't yet in a real game, but like, I would just be like, ah, oh, like, yeah, it was successful. I felt good whatever we'll do it again next week but there is it was missing that competitive side to it it was, it was just like a rehab i was just trying to check off the box and get to the yeah, next yeah. thing yeah you completed a task yeah and you made the next checkpoint yeah i i think the uh, the words i used when when you and i were talking was you got to remember who the fuck you are yeah. and you got to take that to the mound every day um because you haven't been allowed to feel like who the fuck you are for two years. I wasn't let loose. I was just in this yeah. like they they lulled you to sleep. Yeah. Um and so what happens now? You let yourself go. How does that finish up that sophomore year? 
well, COVID happened my sophomore year. <laughs> but, um, uh, which obviously sucked. But it also gave me more time to continue getting stronger and yep. rehabbing and progressing. Um, and then come my junior year, I was pitching consistently for us, but in small roles, whether that was just coming in for a batter, maybe it was coming in for an inning, but really nothing over that. It was my pitch count was still very limited. And they were right. Um, and also obviously we had that junior year, we went to Omaha. We had so many amazing pitchers on that staff. So my role wasn't big, partly because of, like I said, we had amazing talent. And also they're managing me because it was my first real season after surgery. But that was really my first time since my junior year. It was my first time since high school where I had a season. I played baseball. I competed consistently. What, uh, what were the emotions like after that first time you went back out there and got to compete? I mean, that's a big stage to compete on for the first time back out. <laughs> I, <laughs> Uh, I forget who the team was, but I came in, it was like 15, nothing. So like, so like, obviously like this, yeah. just get him acclimated again and everything. And most people would probably be like, oh man, they're putting me in a 15, nothing game. Like it's disrespectful. Great. But I remember afterwards I was with one of my, my roommate, one of my best friends and like tearing up, like just so happy to be back out there. It had been such a long time. Hey, how, how then like, obviously fucking COVID. So, um, but actually, I mean, another almost blessing in disguise for you there, because that software, uh, that junior year wasn't exactly like there wasn't periods of time where you didn't feel great either. Oh yeah. It was continuing up and down with the rehab process. I think that's so important for people to understand. Like it was three years out. Mm, yeah, yeah. It's almost yeah, yeah. two and a half, two and a half yeah. years out and there's still ups and downs. Yeah. It's not just, oh, I'm back in the game, ready to go, full swing. Right. And by ups and downs, we're not necessarily talking about how successful you are. We're no, talking about I'm how talking, you felt. Yeah. How my shoulder felt. Yeah. Cause I mean, I remember being on the phone with you and you being like, there's something not right. And I think you were rehabbing. I was going out there sometimes and sometimes I'd be up to 94. And I, either I was throwing fastballs that year at 85 as well. Like, yeah. <laughs> it was all over the place. It's crazy because you're two and a half years out from a surgery that now, you know, they're going to claim, oh, nine months and you're back to feeling like you. Yeah. Um, and you're two and a half years out and you're like, there's some days I, I can't even feel like, like, I remember you would pitch and then you were like, Nick, I, I needed like three days to feel like I could lift my arm again. Oh, yeah. There were times I would pitch and not throw for two days. Yeah. In the middle of the season. Right. When Which throw can happen. Could one throw for two days and then throw and be like, all right, tell the pitching coach, like, yeah, I think I can, I can, I can get it done again, like needed, but I can muscle through this. It was not, uh, just, it was not smooth sailing, even that far out. Right. So, okay. So now we come into COVID, right? Which is again, like I just said, kind of like a blessing in disguise too, because not only do you get this opportunity to really like work on your arm and, and start to feel real confident again and everything like that, but we had a unique environment during COVID, um, being in New York, uh, which is brutal. But uh, we ended up, the birth of Velo U, we ended up being outside. But now you're around guys that are pro guys, too. And you're around other college guys, right? And other guys that were rehabbing and all that. And, you know, back in this environment now where granted like you're at school now and like obviously you have the experience of a lot of other successful really successful baseball guys around you but this is in your home area right these are people like you've known forever that now some of them have gone on to become really successful how does that time period change the course of your college career and potentially now even professional career because your junior year was much different well it gave me more time to continue to heal and get stronger and get more and more comfortable being on the mound again. Um, uh, it gave me several months to bury myself in the weight room. So there's nothing else to do. Um, right. Cause there was no sight of playing in the future. Yeah. We didn't know what was going on, obviously, but how did it, how did it help me? Well, just, I'm, I'm trying to think like back to remembering you training with all those different guys and talking about the scenarios that had gone on. And I think like when you get to 
listen to other people's trials and triumphs and the roller coasters that they've gone through, it tends to take some of the steepness out of your valleys away because you realize others have gone through a lot of different triumphs and yet they're, or excuse me, a lot of different like obstacles, but yet they're still headed on a track where you want to be. You know what I mean? And they're in that realm of somebody you want to fight to become. Yeah. I think I realized at some point along this time that whether it was getting surgery or something else happened, it was never going to be a smooth road to the big leagues. Like nothing was just going to go all as planned. There were going to be, something was going to happen to make it very difficult where you'd have to regather yourself. And like I said, just stay the course and keep doing what you have to do. Like you see other guys getting surgery or other guys struggling for one reason or going somewhere where they don't get along with the coach or any number of things happen. And you see guys falling off and other guys having success and trying to learn from all of it. Very cool. So we're coming back now. Obviously, everybody's allowed to play again and go back to school. Um, it's your junior year, redshirt with all the COVID horse. Academic shit. junior year, though. Yeah, academic junior year. What are you, a sophomore baseball wise? I was a freshman. <laughs> freshman. Oh, that's right. We, we redshirted with and the, then COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> freshman baseball player in his junior academic year. Talk about that that year. What's the difference when you're coming out of when you're in the fall this time? Or did you land, were we right into, no, you had a fall season that year, right? Yeah, we had a fall. Yeah, we had a fall, definitely. Although COVID restrictions were crazy, but we had a fall. Um, but then come that spring, I was that much, still not perfect, but that much healthier and had gotten that many more reps back on the mound over the whole summer and fall and felt more and more comfortable and was competing again. And certainly not at a hundred percent and not very consistent but hour over um two and a half three but i felt certainly ready to go out and compete at the d1 level i felt ready for that what am I? you have obviously there was this one performance in that year that stands out among all the rest i mean five and two thirds 16 k's 17 potential batters up 16 of them go down by strikeouts uh, I know personally, as somebody who's known you forever, uh, it was tough for me to even watch that with clear eyes. Cause it's like, this is this moment that, I mean, this poor kid has been fighting for, for literally the last three and a half, four years. In the moment I didn't. So context was, it was regionals. We had lost the first game of the regionals. So we had to win four games to advance four games in three days. This was the we had come back one two games so this was the third four that we would have to win it was our now our we lost one one two this was this was the fourth game in three days so we were running low on pitching i start i remember starting that game we had Gurf mcgarry who's with the phillies starting for us i was in the bullpen to start the game it was just me and our catcher in the pen no one else in the bullpen we were low um and he was doing amazing but then got this blister and was bleeding and had to come out of the game. So I went in and this was an elimination game. So I was, just, I think it came in with bases loaded in the fourth inning with uh, one or two, one out. And it was like, all right, this is, I, I got to, got to perform the seasons on the line. So that's all I was thinking about that night. And during the game was trying to win the game. It was a close game the whole time. And as it was unfolding, I realized, obviously I was doing very well and getting a bunch of strikeouts, but I don't know what the score was. We were up by, let's say, three runs. So I was locked in trying to, I could, whether I was through three or four innings at this point with a lot of strikeouts, the season's so on the line right now. I can't sit back or think about what I've done. This game's still happening. I'm still in the game. It wasn't until I got back to the hotel that night and I was in the room with Zach Geloff and he's like, dude, like you did that in an elimination game in the NCAA tournament. And then it hit me. I was like, oh my gosh, like, you're right. I didn't even think about it. I do. Uh, and, and like, I mean, dude, it, it it's not just like kind of a great game. Like that's literally one of the greatest performances. It's got to go down. I mean, in Virginia's history too, it's an elimination game. You throw, it's literally five and two thirds with 16 Ks. That's 17 potential batters that can come up. And 16 of them struck out. 
at what point in that is that hitting you? It's not. I mean, because like, in listen, the moment, I, listen, it, I'm known you forever. I understand your mindset's a little different than other guys. I know you don't realize how it is actually different. In the moment, different. I knew I was, I let's say I was sitting there in between innings in the seventh or eighth or going out for the ninth. And I was sitting there and I knew I was doing very well. But like I said, the season's on the line and I'm going out there for the next inning with the season on the line. Like, I, what am I going to be like, oh, I pitched three innings and I have however many Ks. Like, I could go out and lose us a season the next half inning. No, I get it. I get it. I get it. I'm just, uh, it's like, that. it's like literally almost a, an immaculate, you know, performance there. It's it's literally ridiculous. But, okay, you come out of that game. Uh, what did you guys end up doing the next game? We won to go to Supers. Um, then played DVU in Super Regionals. I pitched an inning. or 1.1, something like that. Uh, I think in game two of that series. And then one, I went to Omaha. But, well, for me personally, I was, to- my shoulder was toast after that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, uh, you I was, I was you worried. the season was over. <laughs> I was trying my best to be ready to try and help us in Omaha, um, which unfortunately didn't happen. But it was still the best experience of my baseball career. Even though I didn't play, that was being there and being in that stadium or in the, even just in the city was, it was, the best experience of my baseball career, not even close. Mm. Why? Just give me, give me like a few things. I know that's impossible. I mean, but... it, it, so we, uh, we played Mississippi, we won the first game against Tennessee. Um, then the next game we played Mississippi State. And once again, Griff McGarry had started this game for us and was shoving. He was into the seventh inning, no hits against Mississippi State, obviously one of the best teams in the country. And then uh, he comes out of the game and they're, I forget his name. I should know his name, but they're one of their best players on their team goes and hits a three run home run to take the lead on us in like the eighth inning. And their fans travel so well. I think the stadium has 26,000 people and probably 20,000 of them were Mississippi State fans. And he hit that three run home run to take the lead. And I was standing there in dugout, obviously being like, fuck, like, this is not good, but no, taking the chance to look around at the stadium going crazy. Everyone's up. It's so loud. This field's shaking and just being like, I need to, although this is not good, I need to appreciate that. Like I'm part of this moment right now. And like, I'm so lucky to be here in this. It was so amazing. <laughs> just the, the whole Omaha experience was our coach, Brian O'Connor, who has been unbelievably successful, gone in oh, no, Omaha a number of times, had always said, like, always put an emphasis on getting there and how amazing it is. And he had always said that. And I was like, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure it's amazing. But once we were there and looking back, like, he really, I knew there's a reason why he was saying it the whole time. It really is that cool. It's amazing. All right. So we come out of that year and what happens? You back on the map a little bit, especially after that performance. Uh, Yes. So then going into my, I was still at school my senior year, wasn't drafted after junior year. Um, my senior year spring comes around and I'm starting for us. I start first six weekends of that season, do solid the first three weeks. Next three weekends, I struggle, lose a sp- starting job. So I'm back in the bullpen, which was obviously very tough. My, I felt like my back was against the walls. My senior year, you really have to do great to get drafted. Um, and <laughs> losing the starting job, the season hasn't, for me personally, hasn't gone how I envisioned it, envisioned it, but I still have a few months left to prove what I can do in the bullpen and what am I going to do prior to that I'm not starting anymore? Like this is still my chance to get drafted and have a successful season. So how did that we went to regionals at ECU. We lost in regionals. Um, first me personally, I. I had good success once from there on out being in the bullpen and then was fortunate enough to be drafted after that year. What round? Ninth round with the Dodgers. Bye. Dodgers. I, uh, I think that year out of below you, we had three guys and, you know, uh, Gary going pretty early, like in the sixth or whatever was you know, hugely exciting and mm-hmm. everything. But and I love Gary, but I just said to him, I was just like, nothing was topping. And you going in the ninth round was one of the sickest things ever. Uh, seeing, I don't know, we were, yeah, I think we were, I like, yeah. Yeah, 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 I didn't want to watch anymore. 
Because I didn't, I didn't want that. Well, that was day two of the draft. Yeah. And I remember feeling like I was prop. There was a chance I would be drafted in eighth, ninth, tenth round, but probably more likely I would be drafted day three and rounds eleven through twenty. Was I remember leaving the being in the gym that morning and telling you, chances are it'd be tomorrow. But obviously, I'm still sitting there and by my phone and watching the draft with my family. And fortunately, it happened that day. Yeah, I remember wanting to work out because I didn't. I didn't want to have to think about how we were going to have a conversation the next day. And <laughs> I was not going to be sleeping that night. If yeah, I, I needed to clear my head. I needed to think about something different. I needed to hurt myself a little bit to just like stay away. And I think one of you threw the phone in front of me. Yeah, you just threw the phone in front of me and it said your name on it. And I was blown away, like so pumped. It was insane to watch that come to fruition. I still think actually one of the coolest things was uh, your dad walking into the building, like, I think like two days later or some shit just to like, you know, come in. And that was like the first time I'd seen him in a while. Yeah. Um, but crazy, crazy ride. And what? I mean, I'll, I'm sitting here talking about my emotions. It's not even me. But what what are those emotions that like, like, how does that all filter through in that moment? Well, my brother, sister, mom, and dad were there. So once it came and became official, like we all hugged and it was a great moment and we we're all super happy and it was years in the making, but, and I took the time to enjoy the moment, and be very proud of myself and happy, but there's the goal is not just to get drafted, it's to right. play and have a long career in the big leagues. Right. When We'd expect nothing else, then what's the next thing I need to do? Yeah. Um, out of you going into now your professional career, obviously taking the same mindset, same things. Um, have you found it more difficult to manage the pressures or is it same thing, similar? Well, the thing that's different is like looking back on my first full season this past year. It's all baseball. There's no school. There's obviously there's like in college, there's no, and also with me being out on the West coast away from home, like I'm there and I'm playing baseball every day. And so you need to learn to learn from the good and bad outings and whatnot and keep your emotions somewhat steady and just keep progressing. There's cause it's all baseball all day, every day for, from spring training through the end of the season in October, whenever it finishes up. But it's easy to, after, let's say, a bad outing, to hang your head and go back to your apartment and be upset. And then knowing that you got to be there the next day too, ready to pitch again. So there's no like, there's, it's like Groundhog. It's like Groundhog Day. So if you start feeling bad for yourself, it's just going to spiral. Um, you just, when did you realize that? Like, how did you realize that? How did you realize if I just continuously get down on myself, I'm never going to make it. Um, midway through the season where I was having good outings and bad outings and one out, I've obviously had plenty of bad outings in my life before, but when they go back to back is when it becomes more of a challenge to say, this is going to have no effect over the next outing to come. Right. I still know who I am and what I'm capable of and my talent. And I mean, that's 90% probably more of pro ball is everyone's talented. Everyone's so good. Um, it's the guys who obviously can continue to get better, but also say, I don't care what you think or how I'm doing. I'm still the man. They have unbelievable control over their mental landscape. Yeah. They know who they are. They know what they need to do. And they're confident in their approach, which is so incredibly easy to say and immensely difficult to do. Mm -hmm. um, it's also the most difficult thing to work on, right? It's not palpable. There's no metric you can pull up. There's nothing that says, hey, I'm better at the mental side of my game today than I was a month ago, yeah. right? Because it's constantly changing and you got constantly different variables thrown at you all the time, which is what makes it so difficult. I just burped into the mic. <laughs> <laughs> which is what makes it so difficult, right? And I, and, and I remember um, when Joe got drafted, and, you know, he was going through his first year ups and downs and success and just talking to him. And, you know, I was going through actually my doctorate in performance psychology, 
at that time and finishing it and just thinking like, wow, what a good timing on this because I haven't talked to any of these guys about anything related to mechanics or diet, anything. It was, this was literally just all a mental grind. And if they could sustain and they could stay consistent, not just with their actions and everything else, but with their mindset, they were going to be successful. And it was literally just the guys that just could not stay consistent with their mindset and their belief in themselves and their, their process and everything that ultimately fell off. Um, how, how does this shape you now for where you see yourself going and what you want to pour your attention into in terms of where you need to get better, how you need to get better? Well, there's certainly a few things I learned from last year that I'll use going forward, which is knowing what makes me good and staying true to that while also being open to learning new things and taking advice and implementing that, not losing your core and what got you here in the first place and what makes you great. Um, it's, it's easy to look at, especially with all the metrics nowadays, to look and say, oh my God, this dude, his metric, he does this so well, and this guy does that so well, and this guy throws this hard, and this guy's breaking ball moves this much. So then look around and say, oh my gosh, everyone. There's always someone who does something better, <laughs> but that doesn't mean they can put it all together or that maybe they do that better than me, that whatever, let's say they throw harder than me, that my velocity is not good enough or that I can't succeed with what it is I do. Um, Like, like I said, it's, the belief in yourself. Um, and is there just, anything you do on a regular basis that keeps that so sound? Like, is there anything you say to yourself? Is there anything that you consistently do in the morning? Is there anything that you're, you know? Well, I think it's a combination of, like I had said, doing everything I need to do to put myself in the best position. But knowing that I took care of everything, I've done everything that needs to be done. And now it's time to go out there and just perform knowing there's no regrets there's nothing else i could have done and stay on the mound and tell myself that i'm the man that no one's better than me so you really use your preparation oh yeah as your rock oh yeah it's awesome what advice do you have for young athletes right now that are in high school that are high level talents just like yourself how do they get to where you are well you have to really enjoy baseball if you don't like baseball you're not going to want to do the work that's going to be required. It's not going to work out. So actually enjoy baseball, first of all. And then also fall in love and enjoy and be curious about the work that goes into it. Because that's less law. the mental side and the being consistent with the work. Or the, right. So you're going to be doing that a hell of if a lot you're not, if you're not, If you're not enjoying going to the gym and doing the work that has to get done, it's not, you're not, it's not going to work out. You're not going to be as consistent in the guy who actually goes in there. I'm not saying you enjoy getting on a squat bar every time, but like, yeah, right. Putting in the work to get better. Genuinely being curious and working to get better and learning and enjoying the process is a huge part of it. We've had some other people on in the past. If you just enjoy the game, game's 10% of it. There's the preparation is 90% 90, 90 of what you spend your time doing. If you're not really invested in that and I'm not saying happy doing it, but no, 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 have I get a passion it. for it. Yeah. It, it, it's an incredibly well put statement there. And like I said, we've had others on in the past that have talked about even, even that are coaches and everything and just talked about this, this burning desire to learn and what that means for future success and consistent success, because the quest for learning accepts the plausibility of failure because it means that we'll have another afforded opportunity because we've learned from that failure. Um, and I think that's incredibly powerful. What you put forth there for young guys is they need to get lost in the process. Yeah. If the process is not something that I'm not saying enjoy, like go in there smiling and happy every day, but wake up and be like, I, this is what I'm going to get done. Like I'm excited to go through it every day. This. Yeah. Awesome, man. Thank you.